Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus
thinking this week guys uh, we are uh, actually just yesterday I was thinking is thinking through these songs um, it's interesting because I planned out the set um, the worship songs this morning and hadn't really um, it hadn't really occurred to me that we're singing this bridge I'll put my trust in you I will build my my life upon the firm foundation of Jesus and the, the second song that I had chosen for today and felt led it to lead was a song called Firm Foundation, and I hadn't realized it until yesterday. I was singing through them in my head, and was like, "Oh," and that's a feel. I just feel like the Lord does that a lot. Like, <laughs> it's never me. I'm just putting some songs together that I think I feel like is just the, the Lord's on, you know, and the songs that we love and things like that, and just just whatever I feel led. And um, I feel like God does this really cool thing where He just orchestrates things like that. And, um, I just begin to think maybe that's just what God, a word that God wants for us uh, this morning, that he is the firm foundation. Uh, we, a couple weeks ago, we kind of introduced this song called Firm Foundation, and it's rooted out of Matthew 7. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this beautiful message of, hey, just build your life upon the rock that I am. Build your life upon me. I'm a firm foundation. I won't be shaken. I won't be moved, even though the rain and the wind may come against you. I will not be shaken. I won't be moved. Build your life upon me. And I just love, honestly, I just love this song. I think it's so rooted in scripture and it's so rooted in just biblical truth. But it's also just a great song to sing. And so maybe that's just the word for us this morning, just to build a life upon him. Jesus, the rock, the cornerstone of which we put our faith into. And so let's sing. Let's lift our faith and lift our hands. Lift, lift our voice this morning as we sing out. Come on, church, sing it.
Each and every one of us needs it in abundance this morning. I speak, uh, speak that just personally, God. We need your grace and your mercy to come, to come rushing in to the space, but more so just, God, to your hearts and to our spirits. We need you. And so we just stand here with open hands and open hearts and just invite you to come and, and do work here. God, we thank you that you are our Lord. We thank you that you guide us through your spirit. Thank you that even though these are just words that we sing, God, that you move, that you move through them, that you remind us of how good you are to us, that you remind us of your faithfulness, and we can stand firm and confident on your life. We can stand firm and confident that you are who you say you are, and that you're our God, that you're our Savior, that you're the name above all names. And we honor you and worship you in accordance. We love you. We give you this, this time that we gather together. Thank you that we
Good morning, church. My name is Jessica Meeks. I'm the Minister of Spiritual Formation here at Heritage. And this past week, I had an opportunity to be part of a soul care retreat with the Spiritual Formation Society of Arizona. And it was a really wonderful time, um, just resting in God's presence with other people. And one of the passages that we reflected on as a group in prayer with the Lord was Psalm 37. And as we were singing this song, um, this passage just came back to mind, and I wanted to share it with you. The psalmist says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. One thing we talk about in spiritual formation is that the deepest desire that God has made us with is for him. And so when we gather together, when we pause and reflect and acknowledge that God's presence is with us, we are in entering into the desire for him that he has given us. And he meets us and promises that he will give us those desires. So I just encourage you with that this morning, wherever you come into this space with, um, the Lord is here with you, and he's inviting you to participate with him. If you are new to Heritage, we're so glad that you are here with us. We'd love to hang out with you after service. We have um, donuts and coffee. I'm going to be out at the Connect and Serve table. I would love to meet you. We're so glad to have you be part of this community. There's a connection card in the seat in front of you, or you can go online and fill one out as well. That'll get you connected to the life of our church and different events we have coming up. This Saturday, we are doing some spring cleaning for our building. So we would love to invite you to go online and sign up to come and be a part of a work crew that's going to come and help make this place sparkle a little bit more. I know my house needs it after a whole year of two little kids and the new puppy we just got. So it would be great if you guys would come and join us on Saturday at 8.30 to noon. Just come and hang out and laugh while we find places to paint and clean floors and all of that stuff. DJ's heading that up. He'd be super grateful to have you come be a part of it as well. And then we have a, an equipping class coming up called Financial Peace University. This is an awesome opportunity for you to uh, learn how to steward the resources that God has given you in really practical ways. So that's going to be meeting at Heritage on Thursdays from 630. And we would love to have you sign up. You can do that on the website as well. And then I'm excited to share with you about some things with Heritage Women. So ladies, listen up. Um, on March 25th to 27th, we are going to take a group of women up to Prescott, Prescott Pines Retreat Center. And we are going to have some space to just be with one another and with the Lord. There's a group of women in our church who are excited to be sharing their stories and what God has been teaching them about abiding in Christ. And what does it really look like in the midst of our day-to-day -day life, in the midst of struggles, to trust in him and in his presence? Cassie Pfeiffer is going to be leading worship. And I'm just really excited for this time together when we can pause and enjoy the beauty of God's creation and get away from everything. Um, in Mark 6.31, Jesus says to his disciples, Come away with me by yourselves and rest a while. And so we want to enter into that invitation that weekend. So registration is live. You can go to our website at heritagechurchaz.com backslash women, and you'll find the registration link there. We have early bird pricing for the next two weeks. We'd love to have you join us up in Prescott. And then our women's discipleship groups have launched. So Heather Siebel is leading one on Thursday mornings in her room or in her home. It's a play date style. If you want to sign up, you can do that at the same link. And then I'm going to be leading a group of women on Thursday mornings at 10 here at Heritage every other week, praying through scripture and learning how to do that. Those times might not work for you. We have lots of women doing lots of things. You guys are up to awesome stuff. So if you would be interested in leading a group at another time, or if you would like support in how to gather together with other women to dive into God's word and really practice discipleship with one another, I would love to help you. Again, I'll be at the Connect and Serve table later today. Love to have a conversation. So now I'm going to invite all of our kids to stand up and go to the back. You guys are dismissed to your class. Your teachers will be back there waiting for you out in the student center. And everyone else, you guys are welcome to stand up, greet one another as we continue our worship.
All right, y'all can grab a seat. Well, my name is Blake Williams. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, as Jess said, if I haven't met you, I would love to meet you. And normally I would be one of the first people to greet you, but I feel like hot garbage today. And so I am saving up every ounce of strength I have for the next 30 or so minutes up here. So hopefully I will get to meet you here sometime soon. But I'm going to start off this morning uh, with a story, and it's kind of a, a heavy story, but in the early 1940s, there was uh, a lady named Eva Moses Kaur, and she was taken from her home in Transylvania, uh, Romania, and she was taken with her parents and her older sisters and her twin sister, and they were brought to Auschwitz II, which is also known as Birkenau, and for the next two years, she survived this literal hell on earth. And one of the biggest challenges was that because she was a twin, she was separated out with her twin sister, and three times a week, they would do experiments on her and her sister, trying to figure out what the secret to twins was. And the reason that they wanted to do this was because after the war, the goal was for every good German mother to have two Aryan twins to add to what they were calling this super race. And so you can just picture the evil that happened in the midst of this and the pain and the struggle that happened in the midst of this. And so two years later, when she's liberated, her and her twin sister go back home to look for their family, only to find out that everybody in their family had been killed. And so they go to the next town over and they stay with their aunt. And their aunt is so busy and so caught up and so distraught from everything that's happened over the last few years that she basically shows them no affection. She asks for a hug at one point and her aunt says, I don't have time for that. And so she just wrestles through this rejection, this pain, this hurt that she's been feeling her entire life. And at the age of 16, she ends up going to Israel. And in Israel, she goes to college and she gets her degree. And then she eventually immigrates to the United States and she moves uh, into Indiana. And for the next 40 years, she takes all of this pain and all of this anger and she tries to take it out on the person who inflicted the pain on her. She was searching for the doctor who was so-called the angel of death, and his name was Dr. Joseph Mengele. And for 40 years, she was on this quest to find him and to bring him to justice, and it just ate her alive. Every day, she was consumed with rage and with fury, and she was so distraught that nobody else cared about what had happened and that nobody was as concerned as she was about bringing this person to justice. And so 40 years... She just lets us eat at her and destroy her. And then she has a meeting with a counselor who tells her that she needs to forgive. And she doesn't understand this because from the cultural context, this Jewish background that she's coming from, there is no way that these people can be forgiven. But inexplicably, she decides to make this decision and she forgives. And for the last 20 plus years of her life, she goes around sharing the story of forgiveness of how she was able to release the hatred and the vitriol and all of the anger that she felt towards those people. And she even went back to Birkenau every year and she would lead tours there and she would talk about how she granted forgiveness to people. And she would grant amnesty to anybody that came forward and confessed to crimes that were committed during the Holocaust. Now, this story was particularly challenging for me because in 2011, I went to Auschwitz and Birkenau. It is one of the most horrifying places you can imagine going because when you walk up, Auschwitz is actually beautiful. There's really well-maintained brick buildings. There's nice grass. Everything is really well-kept, but you walk inside and you feel the presence of death and of sadness and of pain. And the only other place that I've ever felt that before was in the Colosseum in Rome. And I, I have this feeling that God has that at his heart, which is why we're able to feel that when people have suffered and died for him, that you can feel that pain. And so walking into that place and then reading this story, I can understand the pain and the struggle that she went through. And the two things that this does to me is, one, it blows my mind. I can't fathom this type of forgiveness. But the other thing that it does is that it convicts my soul because it challenges me to be better and to push into that type of forgiveness. And so that's what I want to jump off from here today as we talk about this idea of forgiveness and as we dig into the scripture and as we go back into the Lord's prayer and what he's trying to tell us. But before I jump into the Lord's prayer, I wanna pray. So would you guys pray with me? Jesus, I do pray for this morning. 
God, as I've been uh, praying since I got up and, and felt this way, just one that you would sustain me. Uh, I'm just resting on the truth that when I am weak, you are strong. And that in this, God, ultimately, I don't want my words to be heard. I want your words to be heard. And so I pray that you would sustain me and give me the strength to communicate what you have put on my heart this week. And Lord, as we look at forgiveness and as we feel the burden of our unforgiveness, that you would help us to begin stepping out of that, that we would recognize our need for forgiveness, for a savior, and that the pain that we're holding on to is nothing but a burden that's pulling us down. And Lord, ultimately, I pray that you open our hearts. Anytime we open your word, God, your word is useful for teaching, rebuke, correction, and training in righteousness, that you give us your word in order to make us look more like you. And so I ultimately pray, God, that when we walk out of here today, we look more like you. And each and every day this week, as we put these things into practice, that we would look more like you. So Jesus, go with us now. I ask this in your son's name. Amen. Now, throughout this series, what we've been doing is we have been praying through the Lord's Prayer every week uh, as a congregation, and I'm going to have us do that here in a moment, but one of the things that I want to start with is I just want us to think about this prayer before we pray it, because most of us uh, grew up in, in one way or another, and we have these words memorized, right? We know them by heart. And we, we use that phrase, but unfortunately, when we recite it, we recite it with our head. We use our brain to say the words that we know, but we don't think about, we don't feel the words that we're praying. And so I'm going to pray a little prayer that I wrote out before we go into the Lord's Prayer and read this together. It says, Lord, help these words to never grow dull, but to fall fresh on our hearts each and every day. This morning as we pray, I ask that you'd search our hearts and help us to trust in the work that you want to do in each one of us. So would you guys stand with me, and we're going to read together the Lord's Prayer. I have the words up on the screen. Uh, I did go old school like Fisher. I actually stole his slides from last week. So uh, when you see trespasses, don't be thrown off. That's what we're going with today. So I will start us off here. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Y'all can be seated. Thank you. So last week, uh, we looked at the first part of this sentence, give us this day our daily bread. And Fisher talked about the different postures that we take as you look at each line of this prayer. And he talked about uh, these three postures that I really latched on to. He talked about uh, the idea of bowed down reverence. When we begin this prayer and we're talking about God who is in heaven, this holy God who is seemingly so separate, but then we get to this prayer of give us this day our daily bread. And it brings it down to this practical level of the daily bread that we need, of sitting at the table with somebody who is feeding you, who is providing you sustenance, and that you have this uh, prayer of open hands and receiving hands. And this morning, I want to move to this posture of forgiveness. And when I think about forgiveness, one of the things that I think about more so than anything is this posture of releasing, that more often than not, we hold on to the things that have happened to us, and we withhold forgiveness from the people that have wronged us. And ultimately, that's not our job, and that's one of the things I'm going to get into here today. But I want to talk about this posture of releasing, of turning things back over to God in the midst of this. And so we're focusing on this phrase, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And the simple but profound truth that jumped out to me from the very beginning is that we're actually praying a pretty dangerous prayer. Because we're asking God to forgive us as we forgive others and not the other way around. I want to pray for God's type of forgiveness. I don't want to pray for my type of forgiveness. I don't know about you guys, but I still remember mean things people said to me in sixth grade, right? Like, if, if I'm the standard for forgiveness, I'm hosed. This is really bad news for me. And so when I looked at this text, I started thinking, how do I forgive? Or more specifically, how do I learn to forgive like Jesus forgave? Because that's what I want. That's my desire. When I stand before God, I don't want to be held to the standard that I have used throughout my life. I want to be held to his standard of forgiveness. And so we're going to look at two scriptures today. We're going to look at Matthew 18, and I'm going to talk about a parable. 
And then we're going to go into Romans 12, which is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. And this one is less about the practical steps of it. But going back to something that DJ shared when he opened up this sermon series, he talked about this idea of who we are becoming. So rather than the things that we do, this is talking about who we are becoming. And as we become these people that reflect Jesus more and more, we're going to naturally live these things out. So as we become, we begin to do those things. And so the Romans passage might seem a little bit out of left field, but hopefully it'll all make sense when we get there. So I'm going to ask that you grab the Bible. Uh, There's a Bible in the seat in front of you, or if you have one on your phone, you can grab it because I want you to lay eyes on both of these passages this morning. So Matthew chapter 18, and I'm going to pick up in verses 21 and 22 to start, and then I'm going to introduce this. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. Now, this is setting the stage for this parable. So Peter asks this question, and Peter thinks that he's being magnanimous in this. He thinks that he's going over the top, because the Jewish tradition up to this point was that you would forgive somebody three times, and essentially, you didn't have to forgive them anymore. So Peter's thinking that by doubling up and adding one, I'm good, right? He's trying to show off to Jesus in this moment, and Jesus is telling him, no, you don't quite have it figured out. And there's some translations that say 77 times, and there's some translations that say 70 times seven. Now, the idea isn't 77 versus 490 for all you accountants out there. We're not keeping track. The idea is that it's supposed to be so far above and beyond anything that you can ask or imagine, right? And we're going to get to that later in this parable. But that's going to set the stage for what Jesus is trying to teach them here in this parable. So pick back up in verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, he delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Now I wanna give you a couple things that should jump out right away after reading this parable. The first is that we need to understand the magnitude of our own debt. When we read this story, it's very easy in any parable to place ourselves in one of the positions, right? So we are either uh, this one that has the great debt, we may be the ruler, we may be the one that has the lesser debt that's getting choked out, but the reality is we are all the great debtor and we need to understand the magnitude of our debt. The second thing that we need to see is we need to see the boundlessness of God's grace and forgiveness. God is the master in the story, is forgiving. He is extending an unbelievable amount of grace in here. And then the third thing that is going to be more subtle, but we're going to talk about is that we need to entrust God to be the judge, not us. I'm going to talk about each of these things a little bit, but I want to give you context for this story. So when we read this story, we read about this master and the first servant that comes is found that he owes 10,000 talents. Now, to give you an idea of what this looks like, in the Old Testament, it was a unit of measurement. So it was about 75 pounds. But in the New Testament, when you looked at what a talent was, a talent was equivalent to about 20 years wages. Now, if you want to put this in numerical value, this would be like somebody who makes $30,000 a year having a $6 billion debt. Okay? Billion with a B, right? So he is coming in as someone making $30,000 with a $6 billion debt. And what does he say to the master? Give me time and I will repay it, right? Which is laughable because you can do the math and you realize how far flung that actually is. But the Greek word here for 10,000 is myrios. And it's meant to communicate 
the largest number that they had context for. So it may not even be 10,000. It may be greater than that. Again, the idea was to give something that was so big that it was incomprehensible that it would ever be forgiven. This is what he was trying to communicate to Peter in the very beginning, that Peter was saying seven times, and he's saying, no, myriad. You forgive as many times as you've been forgiven. And for everybody, including Peter, and probably especially Peter, this should ring true, right? We've all had those foot and mouth moments, and Peter more so than most of us, where it's like, yeah, I, I know I need forgiveness. Now, when we think about this debt, we also have to grasp that this wasn't being asked for unduly. What I mean by that is this guy had been given something that was not his. The master had entrusted to him $6 billion that he had squandered. So he was only asking for what was already given to him. And so when you recognize how badly he fell on his face, you should also appreciate so much more the grace that's extended in it. Imagine somebody giving you $6 billion and you wasting every single penny of it. But then the story goes on because one of the craziest things is he asked for time, but what does the master give him? Complete forgiveness. Rather than him taking the rest of his life and trying to pay off a debt that he'll never pay, the master just forgives him. He extends him this unbelievable debt forgiveness and says, you're free from it. Now, most of us would celebrate that and we would feel so good about this type of forgiveness and realizing that all the mistakes that we had made had been covered over by somebody who had every right to throw us in prison. And we've all had this moment, right? In our walk with God, at one point or another, you've had a sin that's been more perpetual in your life than any other and you go to God and you're like, God, forgive me of this thing. I, I know I keep falling into the same sin, but I'm, I'm getting better and, and eventually I won't struggle with this sin anymore. And God, who wrote Psalm 139, that knows every day of our life, that knows every thought that we think, who knows every action that we have, is probably laughing to himself in the same way that we do when our kids tell us that they're never going to do something again. I have that laugh multiple times a week of my sweet children telling me that they're never going to hit their sister or they're never going to take anything again. And I'm like, oh, sweetie, I love that. Oh, bless your heart, right? And we have to see that this is what is happening in the story. He's coming and saying, forgive me and I will make it up to you. But the problem with that mindset is that that mindset puts him in the place of trying to earn his way back. So what does he do? He goes out and he finds somebody who owes him the equivalent of $12,000. And he begins choking him and asking for that money. Now for perspective, he would have to choke $12,000 out of a half a million people in order to make this up. That would be like going around to a sixth of the people in Phoenix and choking them until they gave you $12,000. This is not going to happen. And it shows the brokenness of his heart. And I love the way that Lord Herbert once said this. He said, he who cannot forgive others breaks the bridge over which he himself must pass. And this captures what Jesus is saying in this prayer that we are in just as great of need as forgiveness of, as anybody else. And we have to keep that in perspective when we're sinned against. Now, I want us to turn over to that second passage that I was talking about in Romans chapter 12. This is arguably my favorite chapter in scripture. Uh, not only does it have my life verse in here, but there's this section from verses 9 to 21, and it's titled in most Bibles, The Marks of a True Christian. And again, I want us to remember that we're talking about forgiveness. And there's, there's pieces of forgiveness in here and there's pieces of showing grace, but we're also talking about how we are to be identified, who we are to be becoming in the midst of this. And so as we read this, I just want you to look at all of the different commands, all of the different things that we are supposed to be or supposed to do or not supposed to do. Romans chapter 12, starting in verse nine says this, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. 
If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, there's at least a dozen things that I could go through and I could unpack here, but my hope within this sermon and certainly within this series is we've talked about prayer. We're carving out time with every sermon to give time to pray and to reflect and to think through these things. And so what I want to do is I want to give you some time with Jesus to unpack these things. And I'm going to have AJ come up here and he's just going to play underneath. And um, what we're going to do during this next time is you should have had a little notebook on your chair when you came in. If you didn't have one, there's some more on the chairs uh, up around you. I want you to grab that notebook. And what we're going to do is you're going to open up and you're going to find a blank page. If you haven't been taking notes on this, you can just use that first page. And I want you to draw a line right down the middle. And while AJ plays for the next few minutes, what I want you to do is I want you to write in this left-hand column some of the sins that you have struggled with. Now, these may be things that are from years and years and years ago. This might be, um, you know, an abortion that happened that nobody knows about. This might be uh, abuse. This might be alcoholism. This might be debt that you've gotten into. These can be uh, as wide-ranging as, as this last passage was. But what I want you to do is I want you to be specific. So if you're talking about anger, I don't want you to just say, I've struggled with anger. I want you to say, I've been angry with my wife. I've snapped at my children. I don't want you to think in broad terms. I want you to think in specific terms. And I want you to write these things out. And I want you to write as many as you can. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have uh, the list of things from Romans chapter 12 up on the screen. And this can just be a guide. You don't have to go one by one and think through where you may have fallen down in these areas, but it's just an opportunity to guide you through this prayer. And in order to start us, I'm gonna start with Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. It says this, Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. So I want you to take the next few minutes and I want you to spend some time with Jesus and I want you to pray and I want you to write and I want you to think through some of these things and begin to write those down. And I'll be at, back up in a couple minutes to guide us through some more.
If you're like me, you've got a couple pages full by now, and it's very likely, given more time, you probably could have kept going, and I don't say that as a condemnation on myself or on anybody else. I say that as this realization that we are all the unforgiving servant, that it's easy when we look at a passage like Romans 12 and we see the different things that we should be doing and could be doing, that there's sins not only of commission, the things that we've done, that we know we shouldn't have, but as we look at things that we should have done and didn't, these sins of omission. And God's been convicting me a lot of this lately. And one of the things that was interesting was as I was wrestling through this this week and I started uh, just kind of seeking these things out and, and asking God to search my heart in the midst of this, one of the things that I've been thinking a ton about is this idea of showing hospitality. I just wrote a huge paper on it uh, for my doctorate and was just digging through scripture and finding all these things. And it it was a realization that I know all these things and I learn all these things, but I'm not living them. I'm doing a terrible job of being hospitable in my life. And when I was talking this idea of seeking to show hospitality, of being proactive and seeking out ways to love people, that was a big conviction for me. And it was one of the many things that I wrote on my list. And there was also this tremendous sense of relief in the midst of this, because as I process through this, one of the things that I wanted to work us through here this morning is in this next segment, I want you to take every one of these things, and I had you write them down in columns, so the left side and the right side, the right side should be blank at this point, and I want you to read each one of those, and next to that in the right-hand column, I want you to write, Jesus died for this, or you may write, I'm forgiven. And I don't want you to go through this like the kid who gets in trouble in school and has to write a hundred times on the chalkboard, like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. I want you to look at each one of these. And I talked in the beginning about this posture of releasing. 
of realizing that God has forgiven us if we will forgive ourselves, if we will allow him to forgive us by releasing these different things and not holding on to them and realizing that Jesus did and die for my sin. It did indeed die for my sins. And so for the next few minutes, I just want you to do that. I just want you to take this time and to read each one of these individually and to write next to that whatever you need to, whether that's Jesus forgave me, Jesus died for this or whatever that may be. So take the next few minutes and do that. I want you to turn over to the next page. I want you to do the same thing. I want you to draw a line down the middle of this page. And this one's gonna be a little bit more challenging because now I want you to write down the names of people and the actions of people that have sinned against you. Some of these may have been trivial, stupid things but you've just held on to them. Some of these could have been life-altering things for you. But I want you to write those things down in the left-hand column. In the next few minutes, again, I just want you to ask God to search your heart. God, where are the areas of unforgiveness? Where are the things that I'm still holding on to? Ask God to search your heart and write those things down.
when the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray, he said this, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So I read that this week as I was reflecting on that and even as I was struggling just now to kind of write some of these things down. It was this recognition of, of Jesus throwing the gauntlet down and asking the simple question, will you forgive the way you want to be forgiven? Are you able to consistently keep in mind the debt that has been canceled that had your name written on it? Now, to forgive doesn't mean to forget, but it does mean that we have to release, that we understand that we are not the judge, jury, and executioner in the midst of these things, that God is sovereign and he is just and he will not let any evil go unpunished. And ultimately, I'm so thankful for that, that I'm not responsible for that. I love the way Billy Graham talks about this because Billy Graham says, it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict, it's God's job to judge, and it's my job to love. Let God do God things. But what it says here, so far as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all, which means we need to do our part. And so what I'm gonna challenge you with this week is I'm gonna challenge you to look at this list that you wrote down. And I'm gonna ask that you start forgiving those people. This is an interesting exercise that I've done a couple times throughout my life. And the reason I say it's interesting is because there's some people who don't know. They have no idea that they wronged you. And when you bring it up, they don't even care. There's some people that know, but aren't really gonna do anything with it. But there's so much peace found in this releasing of understanding that I don't have to hold on to this anymore. Trusting that God is gonna hold my heart in the midst of this and that I'm gonna be okay. And as I release these things, I'm entrusting God to do what God does. So that's my challenge for you this week. And during the next couple songs, we're gonna have the ushers come up and they're gonna be here uh, for you to receive communion. And I want communion to be a furthered reflective, reflective time. And you can continue working on this. Um, I, I got stymied after a couple because I'm up here just realizing uh, how difficult this has been for me. And so I'm gonna have the usher stand up here and you can take communion on your own time. And uh, Jay and the, the team are gonna lead a couple more songs. But just as we uh, conclude this time, continue to ask God to reflect these different parts of your heart that may be holding back that may be struggling to forgive. And as we think about communion, this idea that Jesus' blood was poured out for the forgiveness of sins, it should really take on new meaning for us, that we understand this was the blood that was poured out for me, for my mistakes, for the troubles that I have, just as much as it is for every other person who's ever sinned against me. So I'm gonna pray, and then I'll have the ushers come up. Jesus, thank you for the ways that you convict, the ways that you challenge, the ways that you encourage, how you use our word to mirror back to us the broken areas of our heart. God, it'd be super easy to ignore the promptings that you put on us or to say that I can't forgive so-and-so for doing such and such but it does us no good. God, if we're gonna chase people around and choke them out for $12,000 when we've been forgiven six billion, we've missed the point. God, you've forgiven us of so much more than we could ever be asked to forgive another person. I pray that you help us to keep our debt in mind. Jesus, this morning, this week, as we reflect on these things and begin taking these steps, I pray that we do it in your strength and in your courage. Because on our own, God, this is not the posture we wanna take. We would rather run, we would rather avoid, we would rather bury and then deal with these things. But I pray that you help us to step out in boldness and in faith and in the power of your forgiveness. We ask this in your son's name.
every week with a benediction and the idea behind this is that we want to send you out with what we've talked about and as I was thinking about this the 
the posture we normally take is we normally raise a hand uh, if you want to receive this, but as we're talking about this posture of releasing, I'm just going to ask that everybody hold your hands out this morning. And my prayer for all of us this morning is that we actually let go of the things that God has told us he has forgiven. That's our own sins. That's the sins of other people, that we release those to the good God who is a faithful judge, who is a caring father, who loves you more deeply than you can ever fathom. Lay those things at the foot of the cross. Take up the freedom that is found there and walk in peace. And so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Amen. Y'all have a great week. Thanks for being here.